Hello everyone. Today I wanted to share with you some lesser known information about oxalate and oxalic acid because this is a topic where I think there tends to be sort of a one-sided conversation. In other words, the information that's shared comes from one particular perspective. And this is a really fascinating topic, but there's just so much more to understand about it. And I thought that you might find this to be really interesting. So let's get started. Now, oxalate is also popularly known as oxalic acid. And oftentimes those terms oxalate and oxalic acid are used interchangeably. There is a chemical difference between the two of them, but for simplicity's sake, I'm going to talk about them sort of interchangeably here. Now, oxalic acid or oxalate is a substance that can be found in some foods that can bind to certain minerals such as iron, calcium, zinc, and others. And most of this conversation on oxalate and oxalic acid centers around diet and dietary sources of oxalate and oxalic acid for good reason, because oxalate binds to those minerals, iron, calcium, zinc, making them less available or less useful to our body. Now, oxalate is found in a number of foods, uh, but certain foods are very high in oxalate, making them not really good sources of iron, calcium, or zinc. And examples of that would include spinach, Swiss chard, beet greens, and parsley. Now, it's important to note that these are not necessarily bad foods. They're just not good sources of certain minerals, especially when they're raw. And it's important to note that oxalate will not steal iron or calcium from your body. So at least that is good to know. Now, here's a table up here on the screen showing the oxalic acid content of some of the foods that we just mentioned and some other ones too. And as you can see here, parsley, chives, purslane, spinach and beet greens are much higher in oxalic acid than some of these foods that are further down on the chart. Now, oftentimes people will say that leafy greens are all high in oxalate. That's not necessarily true. As you can see here, uh, kale is much lower in addition to some of these other foods down here on the lower part of this table. Whereas, like I said, the ones up further are much higher in oxalic acid. It's difficult to avoid oxalic acid altogether, but if we focus our diet on lower oxalate foods, then less of our dietary minerals will be bound to oxalate and will be more available for use by our body. As far as lower oxalate foods go, I'm not gonna cover that here in this video, but on my other YouTube channel, I do have a couple of videos that discuss this, so I'd encourage you to go over and check those out over there. Now, since oxalic acid is discussed mostly in the context of food sources, in general, I think that most people think that oxalic acid in our body originates exclusively from plants. But is this actually true? As it turns out, about 40% of the oxalate in our body is derived from our diet. But what about the other 60%? Where does that come from? It's a good question. It's actually produced by our body. And this may come as a surprise because like I said, many influencers in the health world talk about the importance of eliminating plant foods to avoid oxalic acid. So let's take a closer look at how our body produces oxalic acid. What I'm showing you here is a simplified version of the biochemical pathways that can lead to the production of oxalic acid in our body. Now, what it comes down to is that oxalic acid is produced from normal metabolic processes in our body. We can't really get away from them. Oxalic acid, like I said, once again, is produced from normal metabolic processes. And we'll talk about them right here. Now, when certain amino acids derive from proteins in our diet or particular amino acids produced by our body are converted into the amino acid serine, then serine can be converted into the amino acid glycine, which then 
can be converted into glyoxalate, which can then be converted into oxalic acid. And this tends to happen when our body has an excess of protein. There's a number of things that protein is important for in our body. Uh, but when our body has too much protein, one of the ways that our body can get rid of it is by converting various amino acids into serine, and then eventually glycine, and then eventually oxalic acid. Now the next part of this pathway that I'd like to talk about is hydroxyproline. Now in our body, we have connective tissue that's important for providing structure and support to other tissues like muscles and organs, for example. And collagen is an important part of that connective tissue. Now this collagen needs to be replaced from time to time. Oh, and when it's broken down, during this turnover process, we get the formation of hydroxyproline. Now, hydroxyproline can be converted into glyoxalate and then ultimately oxalic acid. Now, another breakdown product of collagen metabolism is glycine. So we've got hydroxyproline and glycine from collagen breakdown, and both of them are converted into glyoxalate and ultimately oxalic acid. Now the next part of the pathway that I'd like to talk about is glyoxal down here. And that has to do with free radicals. Now free radicals are reactive molecules produced within our body from normal metabolic processes and through chemicals that come into our body through food, water, and air. So some free radicals we can't avoid because some of them are produced by our body, but other ones come in uh, from the outside through breathing and through consumption, like I said, with water and food. So one thing we can do is to eat more of a whole food oriented diet to avoid uh, excess chemicals or other things that might come in through processed foods. And that can help to decrease the overall amount of free radicals that our body is exposed to. So this substance glyoxal here is produced during free radical production. And glyoxal can be converted into glyoxalate and then ultimately oxalic acid. So as you can see here, there are a number of processes through which oxalic acid is created in our body. We don't just get oxalic acid from our food, our body also can make it, as you can see, under certain circumstances. Now, one thing that I haven't mentioned yet is that there are inborn errors of metabolism that are genetically based. So we can't really do too much about that, but we can be aware of certain supplements that can produce more oxalic acid in our body. And one of them is collagen. Now, collagen is a really popular supplement right now. Now, collagen is largely made up of hydroxyproline, glycine, and then another amino acid called proline. Now, our body makes collagen. So if we're taking a collagen supplement and our body doesn't necessarily need it or it doesn't need as much as being taken, then what's going to happen is that the collagen from that supplement is going to be broken down into its constituents, hydroxyproline, glycine, and proline, and as you can see here, glycine and hydroxyproline can go into the production of oxalic acid. Now, one thing I haven't mentioned yet is that glycine can be used to produce DNA and red blood cells and some other structures of our body. But most of the time, our body is going to have plenty of serine from amino acid metabolism to convert into glycine and then ultimately into DNA and red blood cells. So that extra hydroxyproline and glycine from that collagen supplement isn't going to be needed to create DNA and red blood cells. Most of that glycine and hydroxyproline is going to be converted into glyoxalate and then ultimately oxalic acid. The next supplement that I'd like to talk about is creatine. And that's another popular supplement similar to collagen. So creatine contains the amino acid glycine, which is on our 
pathway here, as you can see. And creatine's made by our body. So if we're taking a creatine supplement and our body doesn't need it, then it's gonna break that creatine down in its constituents, one of which is glycine. And if our body doesn't need that glycine to make DNA and red blood cells, then what's gonna happen is that glycine will be converted into glyoxalate and into oxalic acid. And as I said earlier, our body has plenty of glycine that's being made from serine through amino acid metabolism. So as it turns out, once again, if our body isn't going to use the creatine from that supplement, then we're going to have excess glycine that's going to form glyoxalate and ultimately oxalic acid. In summary, what I talked about here today has really just scratched the surface of this really fascinating topic. In fact, we have another video on our website of a webinar that we did earlier this year that expands on a lot of what I've talked about here. So if you want to check that out, I encourage you to go to our website, rawfoodeducation.com and click on the Mastering Raw Food Nutrition tab and then scroll down to the August 2024 webinar. And there is a video there called The Oxalate Paradox that expounds on a lot of what I've discussed here. I also wanted to mention that oxaloacetate, which is an intermediate in the Krebs cycle, can also convert into oxalic acid if we're consuming calories in excess. And then the other thing that I wanted to mention is that there are some studies on ascorbic acid from supplements leading to the production of oxalic acid. But as far as ascorbic acid from vitamin C complex that we find in whole foods leading to oxalic acid production in our body, that hasn't been fully studied. But I just wanted to make mention of that because uh, some people um, have brought that up to me in the past and I did know about that, but I haven't covered it here because I'm looking forward to more research being available on that very interesting topic too. So to summarize what we've talked about here today, Oxalic acid is made by our body, supposedly about 60% of it, and then about 40% of it is obtained by our diet. Of course, those percentages can be different depending on what somebody's diet looks like. If somebody has eliminated all plants from their diet, then that, that percentage is going to change, obviously. But one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this today is to let people know who eliminate plants from their diet that their body actually does produce oxalic acid. And as one substitutes more animal products for those plant foods that they have eliminated, any excess protein from those products can potentially fuel some of those pathways that we talked about that can lead to more oxalic acid production. It's important to know that because Oxalic acid is a normal byproduct of metabolism. So on top of our normal metabolic byproducts, how can our body produce even more oxalic acid? We mentioned genetics and the consumption of certain supplements. If our body doesn't use those supplements for the intended purpose, then that can potentially drive more oxalic acid production. And we talked about collagen and creatine. Thanks for watching. And if you found this information to be useful and interesting, please feel free to like and subscribe.